Oh, Mark, I'm so glad you could join me today. How have you been? I've been quite well, thanks. Great. How about you? And yeah, I'm sure you've been uh, quite busy with your new film releasing, I think, what, uh, two or three days ago at this point. Yeah, yeah, it was released on, on Wednesday, and uh, I have another release coming up in February, and I'm working on, which I can't name, unfortunately, and okay. I'm working on a series uh, at the moment, which I can't name either, so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Not a font of information here, I'm afraid. Uh, you know what, I've, unfortunately, I've gotten used to it, but at least that lets us all keep our eyes and ears open to see what else you're coming out with. Cool. Um, yeah, so with uh, with the latest film, the new Resident Evil film, uh, how did you how did you get involved with that? Uh, well, like most things, it's uh, my my agent calls me up and say we've got this this film. They're interested in you. Would you like to take a look and do some demos or whatever? So yeah, it usually comes by way of my agent. Like okay. pretty much. Well, actually, always it comes by way of my agent. <laughs> And, and so that's a property that has, gosh, I think six prior films and who knows how many games. Yeah. And so for you coming into it, I mean, did you have a, a familiarity with those or was there any sort of impetus to look at that broad back catalog in, uh, when you began writing? Well, actually, yeah, I, um, when, when I was looking at this, at this gig, I, um, I checked out a few of the other Resident Evils and I thought, man, I'm, I'm just not right for this because, uh, you know, I don't write music like this. It's just not my, my bag. Um, so I, I turned it down basically. I, like oh. I didn't, cause I didn't think I was right for it. Uh, because I think, uh, you know, for the good of any project, they should get the, you know, the, the most appropriate composer they can find. I just, I don't want to, uh, get involved with something just to get the job, you know, and, yeah. and try to come up with something that might be appropriate. They should just go for the appropriate person. Um, but after talking to the director, he said, no, we're not really looking for that. We, we really want to uh, 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 give the music a really different spin. Uh, so I thought, oh, okay, well, they want more what, what I'm doing. So sure, that's, that's great. Okay, and then so after that, then what were some of the conversations you had with the director, um, Johannes Roberts? Um, well, uh, we, we uh, to be honest, we, we didn't get off to the best start be, because there, you know, it's a bit of a miscommunication on, on what they were, what they were looking for, because, uh, uh, you know, I, they, they had, uh, used a lot of temp score in the, in the film. So, so I thought, okay, well, if experience, uh, holds any credence at all, if they have temp score in there, they tend to like it and, they, and they're going to want to go for that. So I steered mm. my music more towards the temp score, which uh, Johannes did, did not like at all. He <laughs> did not like what I was doing. So I, I, so I thought, oh man, this is, I don't think this is, this is going to work out really. Uh, and I thought, okay, well, tell you what, um, give me carte blanche. Uh, I'll write you a couple of cues and just do what I would usually do for something like this. And, and without thinking of anyone anyone else's uh, values and judgments as far as uh, what the music should be. I'll just, I'll just completely go for it on my own. So that's what I did. I wrote a couple of cues and, and Johannes heard it and he thought, yeah, no, this is great. That's, that's what we want. Oh, that's so funny. Can you, yeah. can you say what some of the temp music was? Um, no, I, I don't. Like I didn't, I didn't research who, mm. who had done the temp, temp score. Uh, well, because there's always, you know, of course, different composers. Right. So I didn't really do much research on that. And does that partially come from, or that miscommunication partially come from just the relationship or maybe lack thereof with a director? Because I know with, uh, with some of your prior collaborations with Robert Eggers, you know, he has, he uses a temp and you uh, more so lean into that. And obviously it's come out with fantastic results. Yeah, yeah, it's very different with uh, with Rob Eggers because um, uh, you know when he gives you the the temp score, you know that he's he's thought about that for the last three years, <laughs> <laughs> and he's been listening to it. it. He just researches everything to the nth degree, so I know that this is kind of what he's looking for. So my job from then is uh, like after that point is to uh, you know first. Uh, uh, do something similar to the temp score and then lift it beyond that, 
you know, that's that's my job with 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 Rob. Uh, like for example, with the with the witch, you know, I'd start doing something similar to what he had, but then I thought, well, you know, we should really bring try bringing in a choir here, you know. So it took a little persuasion persuasion to uh, to get us to add the choir into the score. But uh, yeah, I I start often I start with the temp score because usually the director is married to it. Mm-hmm. So I start with that general feeling. And then once they go, okay, this is kind of okay what you're doing. And then at that point I go, okay, now we got to lift it. Now we got to uh, move it into uh, our own thing and make it an original thing. So here, obviously you didn't, well, you, you eventually found out you didn't have that restraint. And like you mentioned, you get carte blanche on it. When, when you have that sort of freedom, I mean, uh, what's your, what's your first step knowing that you can kind of be unrestrained and not necessarily do, you know, whatever you want, but not, um, you know, not, not have uh, those types of pre-existing constraints on you. Well, actually it's, it's really great uh, because really the only direction I got from Johannes is go for it, be weirder, be stranger, be <laughs> out there, you know, just go for it 300%, uh, which is the kind of direction I love. So it was, it was a really good experience that way. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, and you know, as a, as a listener and as someone who, you know, prior to ever listening to film music, I just loved all sorts of weird things. And in some ways, the weirder, the better. It's, it's so refreshing because a lot of times you get the opposite in, in film music where it's constantly raining things in. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. so, I so spent my, whole, my whole career has been like that, you know, where I really feel reined in, you know, that I'm a bit too weird. Well, we got to pull that back, <laughs> Corbin. We got to make that a little bit more normal. <laughs> so well, it's, it, it's nice. It's nice to have the opposite. Go ahead. Does it does it surprise you that, you know, I mean, even even though you had some restraints on the witch and the lighthouse, that your music is actually quite popular? Uh, uh yeah, yeah. Well, it's it you know it's it's funny with the um, you know, for example, for the the witch and the lighthouse, um. I, if, if left to my own devices, I probably would have done a, a very different score. Mm. Um, but, uh, but, you know, my approach was like, I, okay, obviously Eggers knows what he's doing here. So I'm going to, I'm going to follow his guidance on this and just, and just go for what he wants. But, you know, he knows, I mean, he's a really smart guy and, uh, and uh, it was, he's a really un, uncompromising individual. Mm. And he wanted the music to be really un- uncompromising at all. So he didn't want anything at all harmonically pleasing or melodic or anything like that. He just forget that just went out the window. So whereas my tendency would have been to add a little bit more of that, a little bit more harmonic progression throughout the score, maybe a melody now and then, you know, but, uh, uh, but he was right. He was right. And it, and it really, um, uh, it made this, those scores stand out, I think, because it was, they were uncompromising. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think with those as well, it, it helps just having some of the um, period instruments, even if they're, you know, not like for the witch, you're not using instruments that are around in the you know 17th century, New England, but no. using uh, more unconventional period instruments. And then obviously just some of your own musical creations as well automatically lends a, of a uh, sonic palette that you you hear and go hmm this is just a little different from what we hear yeah the the idea was to uh to not try to capture the uh like for the witch to not try to capture the the time and the place at all uh but the the idea was for the music to sort of feel that way emotionally you know sort of take you back to that period but you know it's got nothing to do with any composers from that period at all you know but but the the timbre and the sounds of the instruments they sound archaic and old. Yeah, I mean it, it comes across and and obviously uh, you know basically no listeners are going to have an education in the actual period and regional specific instruments, so it, you can you can cheat a little bit as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, but but on the flip side, you know, with with Resident Evil, you hear a lot of very different instrumentation too. You know, it, it does have a lot of the kind of unconventional discord that your scores seem to have broadly, but then there are 
And there's there's some um, actually throughout quite a bit. There's like a, a childlike lullaby chorus. There's more synth and electronics throughout. And is that something that feels a little more natural to you when you don't have the restraints, or because it's a a very modern film, did that just feel more appropriate? Uh, it was more about appropriateness, really, because uh, you know you have to uh, you have to pay attention to uh, the fact that it's part of a franchise, mm -hmm. um, because right from the start you know that because it's um, you know trying to trying to bring the uh, this film back to uh, you know the video games and and what people liked about the, those original games, um, you, you can't ignore that altogether because you know, right out, of, right out of the gate, there's probably a lot of listeners that are going to hear the score I've done and, uh, and think, oh boy, that's, that's not at all like the games. This is, no, we don't want this. We, you know, we want that traditional Resident Evil video game sort of music, you know, we want to be taken back to that, you know, when we first played the game or whatever. Uh, so I knew that that, that will probably disappoint a lot of people. Um, but uh, I didn't want to go straight too far from that. So I did want some some electronics and and that in it but uh you know it still very much has uh has my stamp on it yeah absolutely so yes. what are because you you create a lot of your own instruments as well what yeah. are some of the uh, musical or instrumental combinations that you used in the score um well i used a little bit of the uh the apprehension engine which is a uh, a device that uh, i had built for me um and it's uh, it's basically it's basically a uh, uh, it it's almost like the musical version of a foley machine, you know, sound effects in movies, but it's all in one box. So it's got a it's got a, like a hurdy gurdy wheel uh, on it, and it has a, a couple of uh, uh, you know guitar strings that I play with an ebo, like a, which is a um, it, it's a it's a little magnetic device that you hold that sustains the strings, and that goes through a fuzz box. And then I have a spring reverb unit that I bang, and I also play with the ebo. And then I have a couple of rods that I bow with the violin bow. Just all a collection of all weird and nasty uh, sounds that I like to pull out on on occasion. So that's that's one of the instruments that I uh, used on the score. Yeah, and I I find that so fascinating. I've watched over the years. I've watched some videos of you playing it, and it's just in in one sense it's kind of unassuming because it's you know like a box or table with all these weird devices on it and then it just creates this in a good way just horrible music and sounds yeah and and, and yeah I, I just recommend to anyone checking some of those out and i actually didn't realize that uh, a few years ago you had uh, you had toured with the with the apprehension engine a bit yeah yeah no i i did uh yeah i played um uh like new york and chicago and went over to the uh the uk um uh, they want me to come to Finland now <laughs> really? for, for a concert, uh, you know, once, once COVID is, is, yeah. is done, you know, uh, no, not peace, but you know, let's hope. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Uh, so yeah, no, that's been a lot of fun. A real challenge trying to tour with that instrument though, because it's uh, uh, you know, it's put together with, you know, band-aids and elastics and <laughs> it's not, it's not like pulling a, a guitar out of a case, you know, it's a real event to try to set this thing up for each, each show, but, uh, but it's, it's a lot of fun. When it's, it, it is a bit unusual having those very specific instruments built. I know a few other composers have similar things. I think um, like Charlie Clauser, who did a lot of, who, who's done all the saw films, I think, um, has a yeah. few, like yeah. he has several custom instruments too, but I think now you see a lot of composers and musicians doing like found sounds and warping them or making things, you know, finding the strange sounds, you know, in the box basically in, in their computers. So what is it about having a, you know, a very unique instrument that's appealing compared to some of those alternatives? Uh, I think it's it's all about surprise. Um, it reminds me of some, it's something I was watching the other day. Uh, who was it? Who was the uh, the artist I was listening to? Uh, oh, sorry, it'll, it'll come to me later. But uh, okay. but but the artist says that. Oh no, I knew. No, it was Sting. Yeah, he was <laughs> okay. being inter interviewed on Rick Beato's channel, 
and Rick Beato was asking him about a bunch of questions about uh, about his his use of harmony and and you know unusual approaches to songwriting and stuff like that. And and Sting just sort of cut through all that and he, and he said, you know, it's it's all about surprise. You know, like if, I, if I'm listening to a song and 10 seconds into it, I'm surprised, I'm going to listen to the song. But if I'm not surprised, I'm bored. So that's that's something he always thinks about when he writes a song. I have to surprise the listener within the first part of the song, so they, you know, they don't know uh, what's coming. Uh, and I think I think uh, I'm the same. That's that's uh, my approach is is very similar because uh, I get bored very easily. So I, I always have to uh, keep myself interested. And uh, I think my my worst nightmare is boring people uh, listening to my music. So, you know, I always want to keep it uh, uh, interesting. Did I answer your question or not? I'm not sure if I did. Uh, yeah, yeah, you did. Okay, good. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, no problem. And, and hopefully I, I keep you interested enough uh, so you don't get bored through the rest of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> So do you ever wonder then, or you know, do you ever have the fear of, depending on the project you're working on, not having that ability to surprise the listener or the viewer? Uh, yeah, sometimes that can be, uh, it's, not, it's not so much of a problem with, uh, with the horror scores that I've done uh, since The Witch. And that's when I sort of became the horror guy, yeah. uh, was after The Witch. But before that, I would tend to insert sort of weirder stuff into the scores. And sometimes that would just get dropped because it was just, it was just too weird. So yeah, that, that would, that would happen on, on occasion, but it's not a problem with horror because uh, there's so much more uh, creative freedom uh, in horror. And I think that's a big appeal to me that I can just be as weird as I want often. And what do you, th- cause I've, I've heard that from different composers and obviously I've, I've heard it listening to, horror scores, those tend to be the scores that surprise me the most. But what do you think it is about the genre that has that extra creative freedom and that kind of draws in those people who want to push boundaries a bit? Uh, I think it's the, um, I mean, the subjects of, of horror films, uh, they're, they're much more um, primal, you know, uh, like basically horror films conjure this this feeling for us as as viewers that we're a wild animal and that we're, we're being chased or attacked by another animal it's very primal um and it brings out uh uh or what seems appropriate is is more of a the primal nature in the score so it's more in your face it's it's more you know more dynamic more dissonant more you know angrier and it's it's you know two creatures sort of attacking and and fighting a lot of those sounds, you know, it's like screams and roars and things like that. So yeah, it's just appropriate for, for the genre. And is that what draws you to it too? Uh, not so much. Uh, <laughs> what, what draws me to it is, is that I, it's, in, it's interesting for me. You know, I like, I like new sounds, uh, whether or not they're, uh, uh, you know, horrifying sounds or really ethereal and beautiful sounds that I've never heard before. So, no, it certainly doesn't have to be horror uh, for me because I'm not really, um, I wouldn't really call myself a horror fan. Like I don't watch horror films nonstop. I watch them on occasion, uh, but only only good ones. Um, but I'm, I just, I just like love good movies. You know, I'll, like I watch, I watch like a Fred Astaire musical. I mean, I, you know, I like all kinds of Movies like uh, like all kinds of, of music. You know, we will watch the sound of music every Christmas and and <laughs> and love it. You know, so no, it's all it's not all about horror for me. That's funny. And I had read elsewhere that uh, you're you actually quite like your more beautiful melodic music and that you have a, a jazz background as well. And so, is there you know is there any part in the back of your mind that has a desire to make some you know to compose some scores that are more in that direction um yeah yeah i think so um because because a lot of horror films can that you know there's a certain sameness to a lot of horror films and uh, that can be a little bit boring and like i say i like to be interested so um yeah I, occasionally i like to i like to get back to something that is a little bit more melodic and harmonic like 
For example, the series I'm working on is a sci-fi series. Mm. So there's a little bit more of a harmonic thing going on, which is which is a nice change for me because then I can go back to horror and I can I can be refreshed. You know, I've got that out of my system for a bit. I mean, it, it yeah, that makes sense. And there's yeah. actually, there was a track in the Resident Evil score, I think it's called The Crow, that has some melodic aspects and it's much you know, gentler and calmer for... 30 or 45 seconds. And, yeah, yeah. And it, it, listening to it, it very much lulls you. And then you pull the rug out from under the listener and just batter them all over again. <laughs> yeah, battering, that's, that's my job. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that was um, kind of a surprise to me because, like you mentioned, in The Witch in the Lighthouse, there was less room for for melody and for those gentler moments. So it's funny that, you know, that something that in, in other situations could be more conventional ends up being one of the surprising moments. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's true. I, I, uh, I remember when I was working on the witch score, uh, there was a moment where, where I really wanted to go, like the only time in the score where I really wanted to be a little bit more expressive uh, uh, emotionally or more more empathetic to the the character so that was kind of a hard sell with uh with rob eggers but uh, but i got it through <laughs> <laughs> so in in a film like resident evil there's there's several main characters a lot of them are iconic through the movies and uh, particularly through the games and you know we have this um you know the the romantic musical structures that you know very much pull in like the idea of having themes for various characters is there any part of you that you know has the has the desire to carry on with that or uh, or not really um yeah sometimes i mean the only the only real theme we had i think um in resident evil was that crow theme mm -hmm. that we we brought back throughout the throughout the score uh, but the rest of it was more sort of a go for it, you know, just go for the moment. And and so with that, with with going forward, we've talked about the uh, the freedom that you had. Did you ever reach a point where you went too far and had to start pulling it back? No, not not really. No, I. Uh, whenever I just went for it totally, he was he was like, "This is great, love it." So. <laughs> You know, it wasn't it wasn't a difficult score in in that in that way. So it was uh, it was great. Oh, that's funny. You know, there's composers are going to listen to this and just be jealous because it seems like that's such an uncommon experience to well to have. That. Well, I, I have to say that that's a very uncommon experience for me as well. Uh, it's extremely un, unusual where I can just I can just go for it like that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> And I mean, so so at this point, you know, we've been talking really about you know, not just Resident Evil, the last four or five years of your career. But I think it surprises people when, especially when when The Witch came out and you became you know, at least a relatively big name in in a film score world, kind of overnight, for people to look you up and realize that oh, Mark's been doing this for. 25 30 years and i don't know, did did you have that uh that idea that expectation in your head you know for all those years beforehand that you'd reach that moment of kind of being a you know a, a relatively mainstream name um no no i i i, I didn't really um because uh, i'd been sort of doing the same thing for quite a few years before that like a lot of documentaries which i was I enjoyed I enjoyed doing the work, but I was getting just a little bit tired of it because I, I just wanted to do something a bit more out there and a bit more uh, expressive. Um, so when the witch, um, you know, fell into my lap, that well, it didn't really fall into my lap. But when I when I got the gig, uh, you know, that was uh, that was a huge huge change for me. Uh, I had, I had one other, uh, the only two other successes I've had in my in my career was the very first film I did. Uh, which was, uh, you know, a sort of a quirky, quirky sort of uh, comedy, I guess you would you would call it, uh, like an indie indie comedy uh, called "I've Heard the Mermaid Singing," and it was the first thing I ever did, 
and I, you know, I wrote it, I think on a, like a cassette four track <laughs> and, and a little Korg synthesizer. And that was my, you know, that's, that was, that was the score. Uh, but it, next thing you know, it wound up going to the Cannes Film Festival and it, and it won an award there and stuff. And it was like, whoa. Um, and then I didn't really get anything af after that, but it, it really whetted my appetite for, uh, wow, you know, film scoring can be really cool. So, so, uh, and, and I starred for many years after that. And I had another hit in about uh, 1997, I think it was with, uh, with my first horror film called The Cube. Um, and that did really well. And then I just, I went back to a lot of series stuff and, uh, uh, you know, feature films. Uh, none, of, none of it was really horror until, until The Witch came along. So, and that, that sort of changed everything for me as far as my profile as a, as a composer because uh, the film uh, did, did quite well. Well, that's, I think that's what, one of the really interesting things about it is people then started revisiting Cube, at, you know, having very little idea that it, the music was by the same guy. And, yeah. And I think I, I definitely did that. I watched, you know, I'd seen, I'd seen that film years ago and then watched it again in, I don't know, 2017 or 18 and, and then found that you have the, um, you have an EP basically of, uh, of some, of some of the music from the film. I think it's maybe 10 or so minutes. Oh, and by the way, the, um, what is it? It's the 30th anniversary, is it? Is that right? No, 20, 20, 23, uh, 20, sorry, 25th anniversary. Uh, is coming up for the film, and I got approached about doing a vinyl release mm. for for Cube. So, um, so yeah, there 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 will be a vinyl record for that for that score coming out probably in the next six months or so. So that's exciting. Oh, that is, and and honestly, that was something that I was going to ask of whether because there's been more interest in it from your recent successes, there was going to be a a broader release, and you beat me to the punch. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and. So I guess is that is that something that's important for you because a lot of your free support high profile score or um, films you've worked on have had digital and or physical releases, but not all of them have. You know, you you did the second season of The Terror, which as far as I know didn't have a a music release. The same with um, In the Tall Grass, which came out a couple of years ago, and so it does having the release of your music. You know, is that something that you push for or is it more incidental? Well, I, I, I would have pushed for, um, I wish I would have pushed for In the Tall Grass having released in that because I really like that score. Hmm. Um, and, you know, once it does its run on Netflix, then it's sort of gone and people yeah. don't hear it uh, again. So I would, I like to have releases so that people can go back and, and they can, you know, the music can live. Uh, a little bit longer, you know, and not be so disposable. I think that's why I like uh, releases. And does that feel even more acute with physical? Because, you know, if someone buys it and they have it on their shelf or something, it, there's always a reminder there. Whereas oh, yeah, no, I, when it's, I when it's in the digital world, it's it's still off in the it's, ether a little bit. No kidding. It's just a bunch of numbers in the ethernet. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, and I don't know, I guess the, the, five-year anniversary of the tall grass has to be coming up soon so <laughs> <laughs> there you go <laughs> uh, but you know on, on that same note is that is that something that you think about about how kind of disposable a lot of movies and music can be or at least how quickly it seems like they can fade now from the the public eye uh well yeah yeah, no, it it is an issue because um, you know you you hate to have just this uh, basically your life's work disappear and have it only be about the money that you made on it. Mm -hmm. You know, because you want you want to leave something for the kids. <laughs> you want <laughs> you want to leave some art out there for the kids. Uh, so yeah, no, that it, it is it is important to me. Um, you know, especially since you know I'm I'm not doing uh, you know notated scores usually and there's there's not you know manuscripts that are floating around so people can look into that and stuff like i really don't do that much anymore at all so uh, so yeah it's it's about scores and like you say uh, particularly vinyl releases well and, and actually on that last point you know saying that there aren't the manuscripts floating around what what is the uh, the writing process that you do 
Uh, well, it's it's changed a lot. Like I, I am a trained um, uh, composer, so I, uh, you know, I, I I know how to you know read and write music, and I can do scores and and all that. But uh, I think since particularly since The Witch, my approach has been much more um, it's much much freer mm-hmm. and more off the cuff and just instinctual basically. So whatever pops into my head, I just start playing, and I and I look for those accidents and and surprises and whenever i find myself doing anything conventional i try to unconventionalize it and do uh, uh do my own thing with it so um it's a it's a very different approach um like often i don't even i don't even write to uh, click track hmm. uh i just i just play it in e- even if it's something rhythmic I, I just play it in and then i'll then i'll i'll track it after that because i, I like the uh i like how the music flows uh, without without having a metronomic uh, beat, you know, I, I think in a, in a way that that can kill the feel of a lot of music is that uh, metronomic beat that we've uh, lived with for the last 25, 30 years, I guess. Really? And why is that? I mean, does it just sound a little or does it feel a little too precise or manufactured? It, it breathes more, you know, and it's more uh, it's more human without a metronomic uh, click. Uh, I remember uh, someone on YouTube, I think it might have been, yeah, I think it was Rick Beato on, on YouTube. He, uh, he, he took um, Led Zeppelin's song, in the Levy, uh, um, uh, When the Levy Breaks, you know, that famous John Bonham yeah. beat. And he, uh, uh, you know, he, he fixed it. <laughs> he fixed that beat. You know, and he goes, you know, now now listen to it. And, you know, you can you can hear the difference, you know, when when everything is like placed in mathematical, the correct uh, spots in the in the beat, you know, just the feel is just destroyed. Um, and, and you know, when you hear someone like John Bonham play drums, you go, what a groove, you know, what a great feel, what great time he has. But it's not great metronomic time. You know, it's it's all about the feel. So I guess uh, you know, that's that's what I, I I really love. I love the music to 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 breathe and and flow and not be constricted to this artificial, computerized uh, uh, view of what time should be. <laughs> I mean, and that seems particularly relevant with just a, a lot of the the style and the instruments that you use, where it isn't full of these you know grand melodies or something that it it. When you listen, it's it does feel much more free form. So yeah. you know, if you take take Resident Evil as an example, what was the what was your uh, composing and recording process like on that? I mean, did you just kind of watch the film and you know improvise on instruments, both you know to get the sound and then to figure out what instruments and sounds you actually wanted to use? Uh, yeah, I would, I would uh, like, like any other film, I would, I would sketch it out, do like a bare bones uh, version, and then just add, add from there. I mean, you, the ideal situation, of course, is, is, um, like, like film scoring has has changed a lot because the, you know, the ideal way you want to score is just do a really rough sketch, give it to the director, and the director goes, yeah, I like the direction of that, uh, you know, just keep, keep working on it. Uh, but you really can't do that anymore because the expectation is very, very different. So when you deliver a, you know, quote unquote sketch to the director, they expect it fully fleshed out. They expect it to sound like a, you know, symphony orchestra fully, fully produced. And if it's not, it's like substandard for them, you know? So the expectations are very different these days. I mean, does that ever get you into trouble where you spend a lot of time having this fully fleshed out, send it over and they go, oh, we need something different. And suddenly I know. you've well, spent well, way more time. Exactly. It's a real pain in the ass because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, yeah, you have to uh, completely produce it up and, and they might throw out the cube. I mean, and it was that, is that something that happens with regularity or, I mean, having um, music rejected outright? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it, it can be a regular thing. Um, you, I, these days I'm usually pretty lucky. Usually, usually the, uh, the score I, I do is mostly approved. If I have doubt about the direction, sometimes, sometimes I might do, uh, you know, two, maybe three sketches, hmm. uh, you know, different, 
sort of feels for the for the music and uh uh, that's if I have doubts, I'll do that. If if I don't have doubts, then I won't do that because you don't want to give, uh, you don't want to give a director too many choices because that'll just confuse the whole process, and it'll it'll also look like you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> so then, yeah, you know, with with that, I guess, how how do you find it best to to communicate directors? Because a lot of directors, you know, while they might you know. Most directors aren't musicians as well, and obviously a lot of them will have interests in music, but it's still two different professions talking. So how do you guide that conversation in a way that's going to be best for you? You know, it's, it's, it's really tricky because um, you're dealing with a wide variety of situations. So you can have a director who knows uh, a lot about music and who uh, who can like ruin a score <laughs> because they know a lot about music. Uh, or you can have, uh, 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 you know, a director who knows nothing about music and it's great. Or he can ruin a score because he knows nothing about music. Or a director knows a ton about music and they're great and they give you carte blanche. Uh, so, you, you know, it's, it's, you really have to, uh, I guess, find out uh, where they're at. Uh, what I do sometimes is um, where where people people uh, like directors and producers where sometimes they lack is uh, is being able to uh, put adjectives on music and to describe the kind of music that they're they're looking for. Like I live and breathe adjectives, so when I hear uh, uh, you know ominous ominous motion with a touch of melancholy like i you know right away i can hear that in my head right um and a lot of a lot of composers and directors they don't have that that language so they find it difficult to communicate with the uh, composer so what i have done in the past is uh you know if they say if they say well we want a really epic and i go epic you mean like this and i'll play some you know epic sort of music and they might go oh no no that's not what we mean by epic then, okay, you know, you got a problem and you, you got to figure out what they mean by epic, you know, or you have to, uh, you have to go, this is epic, like, you know, play that, right? And they go, okay, that's epic. And this is melancholy. Okay, got it. And this is, uh, you know, heavy motion, right? And this is ominous. Yeah, got it. Uh, and you, you just, you build up th that uh, vocabulary so that you're speaking the same uh, language. So when they're giving you notes, they can go, you know, more ominous, more ominous here, you know, uh, lighter, darker, whatever, because you, you, you got to hear those adjectives that, because that's, that's what I do. I, I take adjectives and I express it musically. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And, and I, I, I can completely imagine having those very broad, almost, um, I don't want to say meaningless, but those very broad terms that don't have as much attached to them, like Epic, hearing that and going, well, there are all sorts of things that that can mean and yeah. it mudding the waters a bit. Yeah. Um, uh, but it's also something that you said uh, earlier as well, talking about you know, the, the music that you listen to, the films. You'd, you'd mentioned that you don't watch a ton of horror, but you only watch the good, like, you know, you only watch good horror movies. What are some yeah. of the ones that that you have watched recently that you've enjoyed or are some of the horror scores that you've heard recently that you've enjoyed? Uh, let's see. Um, uh, Hereditary, I, I really enjoyed that a lot. Uh, I also really liked uh, It Follows. Uh, I didn't, initially I didn't, uh, I didn't really get the score, but you know, after I thought about it for a while, I thought, yeah, it's it's kind of unusual and it, and it's different and it's unexpected. Yeah, okay, I'll go for it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I I like to be I like to be surprised and those and those two films uh, surprise me. Interesting. I mean, yeah. I I don't know. I I love both of those, both the films and and the scores as well. So I'm right there with you. But yeah. do you think it's harder to surprise you than it is for you know, to surprise most other people? Uh yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, yeah, because I have heard a lot of a lot of horror scores, and uh, that's that's a bit of a problem with um, with horror music because there's it's just filled with tropes. Um, 
but it's also filled with uh, requirements, like things that you have to do uh, because, you know, it's got, it's got to be scary. That's my job is to make the score scary. And there's, there's certain things that you have to have, you know, you have to have those, you know, those high squeaky strings or whatever, you know, so, uh, yeah, you, you need that. So it's a, uh, it, it's a it's a tricky balance between you know doing what's uh, what's what's required and and you know doing something very original and uh, and unexpected you know. Well, yeah, and I mean, for so many film, so many horror films rely on our use jump scares, and often you have you have a musical stinger that hits right when the scare happens, and you know it's it's very common, but you know it's just a kind of a staple of the genre as well. Well, yeah, you don't want to you don't want to disappoint the audience. Yeah. Uh, so you you have to meet their expectations and hopefully surprise them. That's that's my job. So when you're when you're working in in these tropes or in these requirements, how do you how do you strike that balance of meeting the audience's expectation, like you said, but in a way that they might not expect it? Yeah. Well, that's that's a good way of putting it because uh, uh, you know I'm a real I'm a real fan of. Uh, uh, I love screenplay writing, uh, and I actually I've been writing screenplays myself, and uh, that's what that's what people will say about the about the ending of films. You know, you give people what they want, but not how they expect it, and uh, you know that's and that's what I have to do uh, musically. Um, I don't know. I, I I guess you know when it comes to uh, jump scares or something like that, uh, I just it's it's all instinctual. So so if, if I play something jump scary and I go no, I've I've heard that in too many films. I always look for a way that I can I can muck with that somehow and make it a little bit more uh, more strange and unexpected. Mm, makes sense. So and then with with uh, films like Hereditary or It Follows that surprise you a little bit when you watch them or hear them, do you ever go, "Oh, I wish I thought of that," or or are you just you know excited that there's uh, something new and different out there? Uh, oh yeah, no, of course. I mean, uh, you know, certainly if, if, if there's something that surprised me, I, I'm going to go, yeah, I wish I would have thought of that. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, great. Um, you know, I actually really quick, cause you mentioned it, I did want to ask with your writing screenplays, what are, you know, what are you writing about? Uh, well, honestly, horror screenplays. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm working on I'm working on my third one uh, right now, and it's uh, I, I I love it. I don't know if anything will ever happen with them, but uh, but uh, it's it's just, it's such a great creative challenge, uh, and I love I love to have a challenge where it's not for once not tied to someone else's creative creative vision because you you have to have that or you you go insane because if you if you spend your whole career uh, helping someone else else's creative vision helping them them attain that uh then it's like well where are you in this i mean you know you got to have something to, to express too and i think that was one motiv motivation for creating the uh, apprehension engine because you know i'm doing my own thing here i'm not scoring do, not doing anything with it i'm just whatever comes out that's me coming out you know uh and i think writing screenplays is is, is the same thing for me you know this is my creative vision and and it's a way that i can stay sane uh, in this business, you know, I can, I can get it out there. But I mean, I guess in, in another sense though, writing a screenplay, unless you're also uh, directing your own screenplay, it then gets put out there and someone, an individual takes it, a studio takes it, and then they start messing with it and, and using oh, yeah. it for a different creative vision. Maybe. Yes. Yes. No, of, of course. Of course. Well, that's, that's where they say that uh, when, when you write a script, you, you have to make a bulletproof. Because mm. the more bulletproof the script is, the less the less inclined they will be to uh, to change it. That's true. So, That's very yeah, true. you gotta you gotta just do your best to make a perfect script. So they read and they go, "I don't have any comments. This is great." And they <laughs> hopefully they'll shoot it like that. So I guess on on the same idea of of staying sane and of creating things that are yours rather than furthering someone else's vision, you mentioned just playing the apprehension engine and having that, but is there ever, do you ever feel the internal push to uh, create, you know, any solo releases, EPs, albums that are just Mark Corvin's music? Um, I, no, I, no, I don't. Um, I think, 
I think part of it is laziness because I'm so visually <laughs> oriented work, working as a film composer for the last gulp, 33 years, something like that, um, that I really depend on visual uh, images that way, you know, to, to write uh, with the exception of the apprehension engine, which is, which is mostly improv. I'm okay. I, I'm okay with just improvising, but as far as sitting down and actually writing pieces of music, you know, I, I really need the visuals for, uh, for inspiration, you know, that, and I, that, that's, that's my bad, <laughs> but I, I guess I'm just, uh, you know, I, I depend on that now. I've grown to depend on it. But I mean, you know, the, someone like the Grateful Dead has released, you know, hundreds of albums. It feels like that, you know, are largely improvisational. So you could always release your apprehension engine experimentations. Yeah. Yeah. No, I could. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, uh, listen, Mark, I think we're, we're getting close to your deadline. So uh, I just wanted to, to thank you again for joining me, for chatting about Resident Evil and, you know, just your, your whole process influences everything. Oh, well, it's my pleasure, Nick. It was great talking with you. Excellent. And, you know, it's still, it's still relatively early on a Sunday, so enjoy the rest of your weekend. Yeah, you too, Nick. <laughs>